I, th I think there's been a chorus of folks, and I was one of them, that, that was saying, you know, now's not the time to advertise. And, and I've been talking about how marketing has a marketing problem for years. And, and what I mean by that is most people think marketing is just ads. And it, it's, I don't have anything against ads per se, but, but it, marketing is more than that. And my career has never been, um, I've never been in the ad industry, uh, you know, per se. I didn't work at an ad agency. I never managed budgets that, you know, basically were for advertising. I always worked in something that, uh, you know, generated pretty comfortable amounts of, of results and, and, you know, sort of steered my career that way. And so I think that, I think that is going to accelerate. I think from a marketing and a business communications perspective, um, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, and I think I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm well positioned as a content marketer to help brands, you know, double down on helpful content and the shift I think is going to come at the expense of, of more promotional, you know, advertising. Aloha, and welcome to another episode of the Grounds of Marketing Podcast, where I connect you to outstanding humans and sustainable ideas. I'm your host, Scott Martin. And today we have an incredible guest called Michael Brenner, who's been on the show before. We were talking last time about uh, marketing culture, and today we're going to take a little bit of a, a little bit of a dive in the current um, situation that we're all faced with today, as well as have a deep dive into his book called uh, Mean People Suck. Um uh, if you haven't heard of Michael Brenner, he's one of the top guys in content marketing, published uh, so many articles in different magazines, um, one of the most followed individuals uh, for chief marketing officers and uh, CEO of Marketing Insider Group. This uh, episode is he's just a joy to talk with and, and I have so much respect for him. I think this one's going to really uh, give you a really interesting perspective of just where things are going and he's really got a pulse of you know, where marketing is and maybe where your business and, and the way that you want to think about your employees, your culture and marketing overall. So without further ado, let's paddle in. Welcome to the show, Michael Brenner. Yeah, thanks for having me again. <laughs> that was pretty quick out of the gate, right? That's right. So... Well, this is round two with you. We had an incredible episode in the first season, and uh, and yours was one of the most uh, downloaded and talked about, uh, going a deep dive into culture, mm -hmm. and invited you back. And you've just got this great new book out called "Mean People Suck: That's right. How Empathy Leads to a Bigger Profits and Better Life." Well, this couldn't be at a more interesting time. I think mean people suck and this environment sucks. So let's dive into it. Tell us about the book and like, how's it been doing? Yeah. I mean, so far so good. It's uh, you know, I'm, I'm a gosh, five months in now. Um, it was pretty cool to see, you know, we shot up, I think to number nine, I think in like the business psychology category um, categories on Amazon are always a little bit funny, fun, funky, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's done really well. I had little appearance on, on a, on a news show. Um, it's been great. I think, you know, I think, I think the world is feeling, uh, the pain of mean people, um, you know, before the crisis that we're in now, uh, uh, but even more so now for sure. Well, I think it, one of the things that I thought was interesting was that, um, this is about how empathy uh, leads to a bigger profit and better life and mm -hmm. how much empathy is needed in the world today. Um, I think I'm going to, you know, I'll bring up, obviously talk a little bit more about that. But one of the first things that I thought was interesting was empathy isn't something you have. It's something you learn. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's something, you want to share us about that? Like you kind of did some research on that. Yeah, I, I was I was kind of shocked. I kind of thought that it was sort of a natural human instinct. And, and uh, um, it turns out it's something that we do, we do learn. We're not born with it, but we learn it almost immediately. And um, – in the book, I share a one of the more. There, there's definitely some research, and and Dr. Helen Weiss, uh, I mentioned in the book, has done a ton of research on empathy and and the human condition and um, how we kind of how we do kind of how we've evolved essentially to to value it, um, and that value on empathy has has led us to survive as a species, but. But we uh, un now we're undervaluing it as a society. It's kind of interesting. But in the book, I talk about this uh, this video I saw on YouTube. It's really cool. It's a little girl watching a um, watching a dinosaur cartoon, 
and the dinosaur. And if you Google, I think it's just Google, like, you know, little girl uh, di- cries at dinosaur or something. You, you, you'll find it. But it's um, it's just cool. It's a little girl. She's sitting. She's watching this, this cartoon. A dinosaur falls in a pond and gets wet. And she starts crying. And she's explaining to her mom why she's crying. And she's yelling at the dinosaur to get up. And, and, and it's just really, really cute. And it just kind of, you know, kind of shows you that um, – you know, the little girl was experiencing the pain that she was seeing in the cartoon and, and because she didn't want to fall into a puddle and get wet and, you know, be hurt in some way, uh, she felt for, you know, had empathy for the, um, you know, the dinosaur in the cartoon. And it's just a great visual example of, uh, you know, of, of empathy in action, I think. And and how does this like, well, I mean, I think at the core, I think we all understand like, hey, being empathetic makes sense, but how is this like um, something that needs to be written about? Like, shouldn't everybody just have empathy? It, it's so funny. I, I was struggling for the longest time. I had written the book and I, I was, you know, talking to editors about it and, and everyone identified the same problem that I felt. And it was that it missed, it, it's like, how do you say, just be nice in an interesting way? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I struggled with, is it an innovation book, a leadership book? Is it a more of a, a human psychology kind of a, a exploration? And then really uncovered this core concept of the book. It, it it's really it we feel the the meanness in society, and what I found most interesting is that data after you know study research and all the stories I shared in the book show that it's it's actually having empathy, not being an, being a jerk, um, really helps people to succeed much more often than being a jerk does. And so that's kind of where I focused on the book was, yeah. Why does it even need to be said? It needs to be said because w- there's a myth out there that nice guys finish last, and you know it's a saying. <laughs> it's an actual saying. Right. Um, nice yeah. men and or women finish last. It's actually the opposite. And and the surveys and the data and the stories that I share in the book um, are trying to help us all to you know get rid of and and fight that myth and and really understand that empathy is really the secret to success. Now is that for hr or is that just in business in general yeah i mean as you know i'm a marketing consultant and um you know this is a book that's not at all about marketing although some of the stories in the book are very marketing centric um just because empathy is like like everything in life brands that show empathy are more successful at reaching new customers and keeping them um but it's uh, again that was another struggle was this a book for hr people was it a book for leaders was it a book for low level employees and and i think I, I wrote in the intro that i really wrote this book for all the people i met who um who would tell me, hey, you talk about marketing that helps people, and we're trying to do that here at this company, but my boss won't let me. And, um, you know, I would talk to even senior leaders, and I would, they would say, you know, here's what I think you should do. And they would go do the opposite. They would, you know, create a, a television ad <laughs> for a million of dollars that nobody could ever um, sort of point to any success with. And, and I'd ask them, why didn't you do the right thing, the thing you knew you had to do? And they said, because of culture, uh, you know, because my boss, basically. And so that's who I wrote the book for. It's really any employee or leader who feels that, that they're stuck in a culture that um, doesn't value empathy and, and you know, kind of caring for others. So that, you know, if, if anyone that knows you from your marketing background, they're kind of going, that's a bit of a departure. Mm. You did a little bit of a bridge there, but is this, does this have a marketing application? 100%. It's, it's, you know, the first book I wrote, The Content Formula, was basically, hey, chief marketing officers, marketing leaders, you know, folks uh, at brands that are spending money, here's a way that you can document and measure the success of marketing when, when, it's, when it includes helpful content. The, so I answered the biggest question and I was getting from my customers. Um, th- this book is actually answering the next big question, which was, okay, now we know the formula, but we are not able to implement it because the culture inside our companies is to internally focused, promotion focused, product focused. Um, and so, you know, it's self-serving essentially. And so this book actually does address the biggest problem that marketers face, marketers that know and and believe that, that the, the communications that brands create should be helpful, um, but they can't do it because of the culture. It, it just so happens that it addresses so much, so much more than just, you know, the marketers who are stuck inside, you know, working for assholes basically. Um, it addresses anyone who's stuck inside a company that, that, uh, you know, they feel isn't, uh, you know, focused on a higher purpose. Yeah. Because it's like, 
I I look at that the the topic of empathy and it's so timely with the world that we're in right now. If you look at marketing, if you're even you know any level of marketing that exists right now, we're you know in the middle of COVID. Mm-hmm. Any level of uh, lack of empathy, I think there's a visceral reaction to it. Yeah. Um, even even uh, unempathetic social posts, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering if it's part of its crisis, but maybe there's a, with the two, tit, you know, what's it called? Titanic plates, you know, yeah. they just have kind of come together and it's shifted everything. And it's brought this to the surface in a way that I think you and I in our last episode talking about culture mm-hmm. being the new marketing. Yeah. And if culture is the new marketing, then empathy is sort of like the jet fuel for culture to be able to connect with people at a deeper level. Mm-hmm. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. So, in this market that we're in right now, I think we just fast forwarded what I thought was going to take a couple of years, maybe to, to, to sort of evolve. I feel like we're here right now yeah. where it's like, if you're not human empathetic and changing the way from, you know, share help and you're still trying to sell, I think you're going to be left in the cold. Yeah. It's, I, I do think the current crisis is, is fast tracking a, a lot of changes that I think we're already sort of you know, starting to happen, Um, you know, support for remote workers. Um, You know, uh, there's a lot of talk here in the U.S. now and and around the world about universal basic income and all these kinds of things. And, you know, that that there are things that not only make sense, but they work. And that that's what really has been, I think, the struggle. Um, You know, in in the book, I talk about how uh, there, there was a major shift when the Internet uh, was was essentially thrust upon the world, and what it did was, instead of bringing people together, it it, it connected us, but it allowed us to be meaner. You know, it, it it's easy to to yell it to hate tweet somebody um, than it is to say say something like that to their face. And and I, I don't think we as a society really sort of processed that that you know a, a University of Michigan study showed a forty percent decline in twenty years in in self reported empathy. Um, there was a state of workplace empathy study done uh, by a company that said that 92% of CEOs think they have empathy, but less than 50% of their employees agree. <laughs> right. Um, you know, chasm. Yeah. And, and the Gallup, you know, study on, on just, you know, less than a third of us are happy in our jobs and, and uh, almost 20% of us are actively, you know, sort of sabotaging the, the, the outcomes that our, our businesses are trying to achieve. So there was definitely a problem brewing. Um, with the crisis, we found at age did, a, did a, a report that they found that the companies who communicated concern for their employees won the day from an advertising perspective. The companies that advertised directly were, were losing. You know, the, the, their advertising was actually having the opposite effect. To your point, there was sort of a backlash. Um, you know, one one example was my favorite one is LegalZoom did a television ad that said, "Now more than ever, you should update your will." And the you know the subcontext of that of that message is is that just recently? That was two weeks ago. And oh and if you God. search the internet for it, you can't find it because they've scraped it. But I saw sure. it. And if you go to their Twitter account, at least two days ago, they still had a, their pinned tweet was basically a, a webinar on why you should update your will. Oh my and God! You should go. You should go screen grab that just so. I did. I have it. It's in a presentation oh. a, a, that I did. I did two days ago. It's it's crazy. I mean, the sub subplot of that message is you're more likely to die right now. And so you should, I, it's absolutely insane. Um, but Budweiser did a, Hey, we're shifting our production to create, um, you know, hand sanitizer. Um, I mean, that is nothing more than, you know, a brand patting itself on the back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's just, you know, there was backlash against, you know, both of those things. And, and, you know, so, yeah, I do think, I think we're going to start to see a, a kind of, uh, you know, hopefully the new normal is going to be, a, a, you know, I think, a, a political, social, economic um, environment that really, uh, you know, values the empathy that 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 ends up creating better systems, you know, for all of us. I think you, you we raised a really interesting comment, which is the Budweiser thing. And I saw an ad just two days ago with Amazon, and um, they were saying we're we're proud of our heroes and all that kind of stuff. It's everything you would expect from them, but yet. Me and my wife, we looked at it and we're like, that didn't feel, that felt wrong. It didn't feel right. It actually, maybe there's some, maybe when you say empathy, maybe there needs to be authentic empathy. And when businesses think, oh, we need to be empathetic. Let's put out something that 
talks about our people, but I think there's like a different level of vibration or attention that people have when they know it's real empathy or not. What's your thoughts on how somebody gauges that or how do you, you got to be real. Like, I don't think you can just fake it. Yeah. It's the kind of thing where, um, you know, it's like kind of like the bar test for me. Like if, if it's something you wouldn't say to another person you just met at a, you know, in a social situation in a bar, or, you know, or when we can get back to bars and restaurants. Um, but, you know, if you're at a party and you meet somebody for the first time, if it's not something you would say in that context, then you, you shouldn't be communicating it. And, and, you know, from a brand perspective, and this is just crisis communications 101, you know, there, there's number one, you don't, you don't want to come off as being an authentic. You don't want to come off as being um, uh, opportunistic or tone deaf. And that's a, that's a balance, right? So it means, it means identifying that, you know, that the world is in, you know, experiencing something different. Um, but, uh, but don't, don't try to take advantage of it. And, and maybe that's what you were feeling in that Amazon ad. I haven't seen it, but I can, I can certainly, you know, understand what you're, what you're saying. Oh, it had all the right music. It was like, you know, the slow-mo of the people, you know, with masks working hard and, you know, had the amazing copy, but it just felt overproduced. Yeah. And I, feel like that's another component that's almost like overproduced content that talks about being empathetic almost doesn't feel empathetic. And I'm wondering if there's a convergence of like, you have to almost create authentic content for it to become a cause as being empathetic. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and one of the best ways to do it, I think, is just have other people say it, you know, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's, yeah, let someone else say it for you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, it's kind of like the, ter- the term when people call themselves gurus and thought leaders, it's, it's, um, it's a, a title that only someone else should bestow upon someone. <laughs> you know? totally. Oh, my gosh. And, and I think that like this whole shakeout that's going on right now, like, I mean, I'm calling it a shakeout. I know it's the coronavirus and people are suffering. I'm not trying to make light of it i'm just more thinking about in the business of marketing and and business leadership and stuff i think this is shaking out the charlatans like because the rules are out the door there's a whole new uh landscape and you can't rely on oh i read this somewhere this is best practice the people that are going to lead right now have to be able to navigate a changing environment on the fly don't you agree like or what's your take on where we're at right now with all this change yeah, I, I think um, I think there's you know a, a few different uh, people have talked about the various stages of, of grief, <laughs> you know. So I, th- mm-hmm. I think I think the whole I think everyone in the world is kind of going through different stages, and so, some of them are, you know, still in the non acceptance phase. Some are some are in the sort of um, holy crap phase. Uh, I don't know what to do. Um, I think some folks are starting to prepare, you know, for. Um, you know, I think some of us that have moved through those stages are starting to to try to think and prepare for what's coming, um, which is really the best place to be. But we all have to go through our own you know process and journey. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I do th- I do think that we're starting to hear and see some of the potential uh, you know impacts is that's going to take place from a work perspective, from a you know from a life perspective for sure. Yeah. So when, when mean people suck and you're talking about bigger profits, how do you foresee from when you wrote this book to where we are today, what's changed or has anything changed from the, you know, what you're thinking? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things it's interesting, one of the the core concepts of the book is, um, is what I call, um, the bullseye and it's, uh, I'm not an organizational design, you know, expert. I certainly don't have a PhD in anything related to org design, but um, the the bullseye is a is a commentary uh, and and a, a solution proposed solution to the problem of the org chart, and and basically in in the book and when I do speeches I always make the joke that you know um, org charts are made of real people and 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 I show this kind of cartoon about you know org charts that where you know there's people having affairs and people doing drugs and people you know people participating in in you know jealousy and hatred and and backroom deals and all kinds of stuff. But I think that the current situation is going to expose the problems with the org chart even more. And, and, you know, I've worked in organizations where there was what I called executive worship. Um, There were people, you know, those kind of uh, minions that would follow executives around and and their whole sole purpose in life was to make, you know, was to brown nose and make that executive happy. I think that's really going to change. Um, The bullseye is a proposed solution where I say, you know, we put people in boxes and draw lines between them in org charts, but we forget the most important person, and that's customers. 
And um, I think what you're going to see is now in a remote, in a more remote workforce, um, I think we're going to see a, a bigger focus on customer experience and customer centricity. Customer experience was a term that was being used a lot in the last year or two. Digital transformation is a term that's been used a lot in the last few years. But I think those things are really going to accelerate now. And and I think that there is going to be kind of a rethinking of what org organizational design looks like and what org charts should be and how well they focus on on customers and how well those companies then realize they need happy and productive employees to, to kind of meet that mission. Yeah. And if you loop back to your uh, last episode with me, you know, really talking about when you have your culture right, they're the ones that are the front line with your business. Mm -hmm. And that's how your marketing is. I mean, that's where the rubber hits the road. I mean, that is where the marketing hits the road right there, that face-to-face -face interaction. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I guess I'm sort of thinking about what we're in right now that, this whole Zoom, you know, movement. I wrote an article called "Face-to-Face -face Marketing Being a New Category," mm -hmm. and that it doesn't exist, but it, it kind of does already, and it's always been around. But we don't even. It's like I actually think like this whole Zoom and face-to-face -face is in its infancy. Mm -hmm. And if I think about what you're saying, and I think it's timed with this, um, there's going to be more FaceTime between customer experience. Yeah, possibly this is my theory um, and businesses with like sort of face to face technology, because there's gonna be more of this remote working that's going to require a deeper level of empathy because you can't get away with just, it's, it's just different when you're face to face, you have to be able to engage um, and, and satisfy and create an experience for customers for them to come back. Yeah. And yeah. What's your thoughts on what I'm thinking there? Yeah, well, it it I, I we actually just we have a client in the in the sort of video conference space. In fact, I'm I'm really was really um, over the moon this morning. I saw a report um, from a company called Trust Radius that did some research on the biggest growing categories and brands, and and this client was actually the largest, fastest growing um, searched for product in the last four weeks. And um, we just did an article for them. It's basically it's how everyone is now in telesales. Or, or everyone that's in sales is now in telesales, and and you know there's no there's no more you know uh, suits getting on planes to make the big, close the big deal, um, you know. And and if I was in sales, and I remember you know account executives as they were usually called, love to make fun of the BDRs, the business development reps, the folks who kind of make the phone calls. Um, mm -hmm. And and part of the focus of that article to answer your question is it. We're going to see these these sort of highly paid executives now really need to focus on social selling, and I've been you know I've been talking to clients about social selling for ten years, and we do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even use the term; I, I just call, call it employee activation. But it, it's it's really simple stuff. It's hey, you're an employee of the company, but the company doesn't own you. The company is better served if you have a strong personal brand, and that's true for salespeople. It's true for marketers. It's true for you know. It's true for the the administrative assistants. It, we want people that look good on paper and on LinkedIn um, working for our companies, and so you know, updated profiles and reaching out to connections and creating content and and you know, doing all of those things online um, were only done by a small handful of people in the past. I think that's going to change for sure. But a, but a, like a really good LinkedIn profile and all that kind of stuff is great. But there's nowhere to hide when you're on a video. That's right, person to person. So your personal brand mm -hmm. now is really can you interact with empathy, mm -hmm. um, intelligently, and solving problems because there's nowhere to hide. You can't just like send me an email like have all these like processes in between you and and the clients anymore. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, and I think it's going to be another thing I think we're going to see a lot of people focusing on is just the art of storytelling too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think as we see the, the sort of the mean boss, um, uh, you know, even mean supplier, uh, you know, kind of thing is start to, to hopefully disintegrate. I think we're going to see more people learning the art of, uh, and the effectiveness of telling a good story. Um, and I think to your point, you know, being being personable, authentic, and and actually interesting is even more important when you're on video with somebody. Absolutely. And what about the backdrop? Like you can't just like be in some janky apartment and closing big deals, right? Like you're going to see the a whole rise of uh, backdrop branding, like mm -hmm. how to set up a perfect, you know, video conferencing backdrop. 
definitely. Yeah, yeah. I actually got one from Amazon. It's a, it's basically like a, um, uh, like a brick wall. It looks like a brick wall in an industrial office. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so you've actually designed. My, well, that's, I'm not laughing at you because I actually have two. Mine's got like surfboards, and I live in a, I live in Canada, so it's like for me. I, I wish I lived somewhere tropical. So I have like tropical plants around me. It's like a jungle. Like if we did this on video, you would just be like thinking I'm in Hawaii or something. But <laughs> I do it intentionally because it's just like it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. It dampens the sound. But also I think it looks pretty good on video. And I'm on video all the time. I've been doing it for years. Yeah. So when people go, you know, post-COVID, you know, pre-COVID, I'm like nothing's changed. This yeah. is kind of how I live, right? Same. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I got another con uh, concept that I was thinking about that really le like that I think you're on the point with this empathy is that this distance um, we'll call it you know distributed uh, uh, working from home you know business and an office potential that I think a lot of businesses are going to probably remain there. I heard of some stat that 25% of businesses or people in business will stay working at home. I don't know what you've heard, and I'm wondering like not wondering it's like I actually think. It's 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 easier to be mean. I'm guessing if you're the boss and people are in your environment, but you you require more sort of um, support, and it's harder to do at distance. So you almost almost you have to be more empathetic, don't you think? Or is it? Or do you think it's like people are more mean when you're working remotely? I would just think it's the opposite because you're like, man, that person could be like you know watching TV and eating nachos. I really need to find a way to motivate them and I need to work with them. What's your thought on the whole, how empathy works in this whole discussion of like in the workplace? Yeah. I mean, well, I was, I was talking to somebody last week about how, you know, it's easy to misread someone's intentions on, in an email. Um, and, and, you know, we've been dealing with that for 25, 30 years. Uh, but I think it's even, you know, more people who aren't used to it are going to be working from home. And so one of the things I was talking about was, that we need to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, so there, there, some of those interpersonal skills we're going to have to relearn for the folks who aren't used to remote, uh, you know, like you said, to kind of mandating directions and, uh, you know, from a position of authority. And so, yeah, we've, you know, we're going to, we're going to need empathy even more, right? We need to give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume that they're yelling at us. Um, my wife was once told that her email, uh, her email uh, approach is very terse, and of course, somebody said that to her over email, and and um, you know she she didn't take it as negatively as she could have, and had a conversation with the person. But uh, you know, I think we're just going to need to be more open and and uh, you know willing to work through those kinds of potential miscommunications. Do you think it's also um, going to create a little bit of a different, more casual? Because look at look at what's happened in like in the years that you and I have been working. I remember I wore a suit to my first advertising job, and then I wore a suit without a tie, and then it was like full on t shirt with as long as you had nice shoes, and it's like <laughs> jeans and a t shirt dot com. But like, do you, you know what I mean? And now we're going. You know, you're. I, I just was on a Zoom call with a guy who's a lawyer, is a huge lawyer, and the guy was wearing a ball cap, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've always seen you in a suit, but you're now that's okay, like. Mm -hmm. Do you, like I think that's kind of cool uh, in a way where it's really is both the content, but I'm wondering, it's like, where, what's your thoughts on that? I just kind of think it's some funny thought. Yeah, no, I mean, it, well, it's it, there's going to be winners and losers, and I think one of the, you know, I, I have a client, I have two clients that that are uh, in unfortunate positions. One is a, um, you know, sort of a uh, industrial support or service industry to uh, commercial real estate, um, you know, market. So I think you know the WeWorks of the world are really going to struggle. Um, and then another one is um, well, they they just they had their funding pulled. Yeah, they did, they did, and that was kind of right in the beginning. But you know, I don't think we've seen anywhere near the the impact that we're going to see when companies decide, like you said, if twenty five percent of of employees never go back to an office, obviously companies are going to have to start getting rid of those assets and those. You know, it's, so it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, and you would have thought WeWork was totally on trend, yeah. right? Where it's like people are like having distributed workforce or I don't want an office, but I want to be able to work around people. Don't you think people are going to go, I really can't wait. Like there's almost going to be an explosion because people are going to be like missing being around other people. Or do you think that this has changed forever? People just now going, you know what? I can just do it from home. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of I think a lot of employees will never go back to an office, and mm-hmm. and now that that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to stay in their home office. So we, we work might be fine, but I do think the commercial real estate folks are are really going to struggle. Um, I think commercial real estate in general is going to have a rough time for the next couple of years. So there's going to be a shakeout there. But you know, where where one you know where one thing goes down, another thing comes up, and maybe maybe it means you know we finally get back to affordable housing inside you know New York and San Francisco, and you know those. <laughs> kinds of things. So, so, you know, instead of businesses, it'll be, you know, they'll, they'll be converted to, to, you know, housing for people. So I don't know. I think, uh, I think we're going to see a lot of things that are going to change for, for good, you know, for good. Yeah. It's going to be totally, I just, I, I, like, I'm wondering if people that are in the city, like I was thinking about somebody in New York that's in a small apartment, can't leave. You're not used to spending more than, you know, dinner and, and night with your kids and family in a small apartment and you've been living like this trying to work like this i wonder if there's gonna be a mass exodus and people moving to the country i you know i i don't know but i will say this we have my family and i have been binging on these um uh like building off the grid shows (laughs) on uh for us it's called the diy network it's it's it's, uh but you know and and doomsday preppers and all those kinds of things um Mm -hmm. i heard that the, the biggest hottest selling item in in walmart last week was sewing machines uh, so people are kind of getting back to hobbies, um, you know. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's going to be lots of different, you know, sort of changes that are that are going to ripple through. I, I think it's going to be more human. Mm-hmm. I think this is great. I actually, there's a lot of ways. Like when it's to be collectively all stopped and just at the exact same time, it just had more pause mm-hmm. and and pausing about why are we doing what we're doing? Like what, like all the habits that you just people get into and stopping and rethinking them. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering how many people have like myself, I have two vehicles in my garage. They're just sitting there. I'm like, do I need both of them? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like things like that, that's going to change my purchase decisions, but also how I purchase, like we've got our groceries delivered because I tried to code Costco last time. And it took me like an hour and a half <laughs> to just get in. And, and I'm like, that was easy. And we've never really had groceries delivered. So I wonder, that's just the beginning of many things that we haven't seen that's going to change how people buy and think. And I'm wondering if you could look ahead. You've been, I know you've been thinking about this a little bit, I'm sure. If, yeah, you're, you know, in, in marketing and business, what do you see as some of the things that are going to change? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, my, my, you know, I, th- I think there's been a chorus of folks, and I was one of them that that was saying, you know, now's not the time to advertise, and and I've been talking about how marketing has a marketing problem for years, and and what I mean by that is most people think marketing is just ads, and it, it's I don't have anything against ads per se, but but it marketing is more than that, and my career has never been, um, I've never been in the ad industry, uh, you know, per se. I didn't work at an ad agency. I never managed budgets that you know, basically were for advertising. I always worked in something that, uh, you know, generated pretty comfortable amounts of, of results and, and, you know, sort of steered my career that way. And so I think that, I think that is going to accelerate. I think from a marketing and a business communications perspective, um, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, and I think I'm, I'm hoping I'm well positioned as a content marketer to help brands, you know, double down on helpful content and the shift I think is going to come at the expense of, of more promotional, you know, advertising. I, I, here in the States, I love to make fun of Chevy. The, um, I don't know. I forget if I mentioned this on our last episode, but there, the Advertising Research Institute did a study and said that after 48 ad impressions in a month, people actually are less likely to buy the brand. And, oh, I believe it. And if you watch a if you watch a football game here in the U.S., you'll see Chevy truck ads. Uh, you know, about every fifteen. You know, just every mm-hmm. ad, ad ad break is a is a Chevy truck ad. And so, in the course of one three hour football game, you might see forty eight ads for Chevy, and it just makes me hate them. And um, so, I think there's going to there's I think we're going to see in marketing a, a continuation of that backlash against um, you know just sort of self serving advertising. Um, you know, and again, it's I'm, it's nothing against it. There are certainly situations where I think it can be and should be used. It's just uh, um, I just don't think it's going to be the thing that marketing will be known for. Yeah, that's a really good point. You brought up three things that just like went toot, 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 for me. One of them was good advertising on a bad product can put you out of business mm-hmm. right quick, right? And the other is resourcefulness. 
I think like that's why that's why I think you and I really connected initially when I've been following you for years is that you've always been about resourceful marketing in the sense that and that's what my whole book's about is sustainable growth marketing. And it's like how all there's all these resources and capabilities that are within the natural state of the business that you can generate that is marketing. You don't need to just go buy favor. Mm-hmm. You need buy in. Yeah. And that's why I think I think we're what you're saying and what I believe you're saying anyways is that there's going to be more resourcefulness and especially with budgets being squeezed. And now with who knows what this is all going to look like, like you're going to have to be uber resourceful mm-hmm. to be able to market. And what does that even marketing look like? If it looks like an ad and it feels like an ad and smells like an ad, I think it's people are going to be rejecting it. And and for me, that's the best thing in the world. Cause I actually think that marketing is amazing when done right. Mm-hmm. It's, what this advertising is the opposite of what I believe marketing really needs to be. It needs to be useful, helpful, beautiful. Um, it needs to be congruent with your values. And it's, it's always astonishing to me how people have the businesses have this, these, they, they hail that they have these great values, but yet their advertising is sort of the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. You, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, you know, again, an undercurrent in the book, mean people suck was for those folks that know me as a marketing person, um, I'm, I was trying to define what I think is the future, and the future really is that marketing will no longer be like a, a department. It's everybody's in marketing. And I, I once said in a, in, a, in a keynote, "HR is the new marketing," and I saw this awful look of fear on the faces of the marketing people I was presenting to. So I, I don't say that anymore. But what I mean is that uh, regular employees sharing. Um, you know, sharing what they know and what they love with their customers and their connections is going to be the marketing of the future. It's going to help. It's going to help communicate what the brand does. It's going to help communicate what the brand knows. It's going to communicate that it's a great place to work if it is. Um, that's going to attract more talent. That's going to want to take care of customers and share what they know and what they love. And and it's going to come from. You know, I think it, we're seeing it already. We're starting to see companies you know, focus on, and, and, you know, some people call it influencer marketing or advocacy marketing. Um, but it's really just finding the, finding the champions and the advocates that you already have and giving them a voice. And, and, um, that's always been a good thing to do. And yet we don't, you know, there's not a lot of formal programs around that, that focus on it. Yeah. Like you would say influencer marketing, that's where it goes to the unauthentic side. When you go, Hey, let's buy some attention for somebody to talk about our product. I think what you're talking about is what I've seen a huge rise in. And and one of my buddies, Jamie, um, Dr. Grimes, he is a clinic and his um, he had to completely do a pivot. I did a strategy session with them and they no longer could get clients. So they decided to do all online tele uh, client. Uh, uh, I guess they could, you know, could say consult consultations mm-hmm. and support, but they also, he got his staff to start, making videos on YouTube and stuff and they're doing it regularly and they're all they're the most unlikely individuals talking about really different things, but it works and it's actually getting a ton of traction. And I think that's what you're seeing is employees are stepping up and being the part of the voice of marketing, no longer a marketer directing. And there's a campaign that's beautifully designed and curated and all that stuff. It's like, it's more raw and real. It's like, there is no separation. In fact, because of you, you changed my uh, sort of my uh, diagram of what I think marketing really is, uh, or at least the components of it. And um, you've added culture, right? It used to be marketing innovation was the two biggest levers in my mind for a business. And it's, it's marketing innovation and culture, mm-hmm. I believe. Yeah. And uh, that's part and parcel with the conversation that you and I had. And I just kept going down that path and you just really – you, I've always thought that, but with that, that podcast was really great. And that's why I really wanted to have you back because I also wanted to commend you because it's like, it put me down the path of how visible the pattern on and the importance of people and, and this, this new sort of shift where it's like being more human and by being more human, you have to actually put a human in front of it. Like you can't just, it's like putting an ad or something between you and the human is almost less human. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when I do, when I do workshops with clients, I, I always point to, you know, when you, if you're in a city and you walk by a newsstand, you don't see um, magazines with, with images of, of things. You see magazines with images, pictures of faces of real people, because that's what sells. We're, we're naturally attracted to other people. And, and the same is true for corporate, you know, like websites. If you go to, you know, 
if you pick 10 random websites, you're going to see probably six of them have, you know, the, as we'd love to call them, the hero shot of their product. Um, when what they should have is a picture of one of their customers, you know, happy and smiling. <laughs> uh, or, a real one. Yeah. A real Not picture. a fake one. Yeah. Not like a Chevy commercial yeah. where you're like, you know, I love my Chevy. And you know, the guy is just an actor. It just yeah. doesn't feel real well it's actually funny so the chevy ads here i don't know if they're the same for you but it's it's real people not actors and um there's a there's a um there's a youtube series of videos that um that basically make fun of the commercials and it's like if there were truly real people in the real people not actors commercials and those those videos have 10 times more views than the actual Chevy ads on YouTube. So, so the parody ads actually do better than the ads. Parody does better than the ads. And, and you could argue, and there's probably a skeptic out there that would argue, well, uh, you know, uh, any news is good news, you know, or any, and there's no such thing as bad PR. Well, I, I would disagree <laughs> when it comes to that for sure. Oh my gosh. That's funny. You know, it's, I did a, uh, do you ever remember gravity blankets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I never got mine delivered initially. Uh, it took like a year or something and a half. But in the time from when I ordered it, when they promised delivery, they just shut down communications and all this stuff. So I actually put up a Facebook page called the Anti-Gravity Blanket, <laughs> um, it, the one that doesn't deliver. And it's like, I got a massive amount of following. They've since delivered. And and I've even posted and let people know. But I just left it up and it, things just got tons of traction. Uh -huh. And it just shows that, you know, people relate when you're – and in that case, maybe I'm being empathetic to the fact that we all weren't getting our blankets delivered, weren't being communicated to. The lack of like you know concern for just keeping us up to speed, and then just making poking a little bit of fun at it, you know, it just it hits a note with people. And I think that's what that Chevy ad uh, example on YouTube you're talking about is. That's the danger for a business that tries to go there is that you know you're going to get called out, and if you get called out in a funny way, it almost like has its own viral effect. That's Probably not good for you. Exactly. Exactly. So going forward in the future, so we're talking empathy on people. I'd like to kind of talk about empathy in AI. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're moving toward more um, uh, of an AI uh, world, whether it's for marketing or just business in general, uh, communications and so forth. And I'm wondering, you know, is there going to be like a, a – you know, an empathetic AI or they're going to try to, I mean, I think that's going to be the case, but what's your thoughts around that and empathy and can it be only for humans? Yeah, no, it's great. I actually, um, I, I, I sort of came up with a line to address it that uh, it, it feels like a paradox to me. So I call it the paradox of AI is that the more we use it, the more human we're going to need to be. And, and what I mean by that is um, I don't think that our future is going to be ruled by you know robots that take over the world there's never going to be um i think a, a company that is uh chosen over another one because their ai is better than another i do think that ai is going to help us understand the patterns and understand the things that work but the research that's already done shows that we we do business with brands that we like we do business with brands not because they have a great chat uh, box on their homepage. But because we either believe in what they're doing and, and increasingly and younger generations are, are, you know, two, three X more like this, um, only working with companies that have, you know, a larger purpose and have, um, you know, like a, a, you know, a sort of a CEO who, who puts a value on empathy and human connection. And so I think the more we use AI, the more human companies are going to realize they need to be. Yeah. And I, I think that AI, my, my take is that. There's going to be AI. People are going to use AI just like they're using marketing automation today, mm -hmm. and it's going to be overused. Mm -hmm. um, or you can use automation that enables more human interaction. And I think that's maybe where AI could really do a, a value add, which is maybe almost like as a guide to human interactions. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, like I saw one. The reason why I bring that up is I saw an AI. Um, shoot, I can't remember the name of it. But what it was is it. Um, was meant for for uh, an understanding the person that you don't know yet. So it goes into their LinkedIn profile and it goes, hey, it appears that this person like would prefer this type of tone and it just gives them a description of like the style of, of, of um, the way they like to be interact with. Uh, and it wasn't really like very super accurate, but it, it was cool that it was going in that direction where it was like it was really enabling you to go, 
what's the best way to try to maybe approach this person I don't know based on the information I have on the internet on them. Mm-hmm. And um, and I thought it was cool because it wasn't an AI interfacing with that person. It was just informing me on how I could just be, um, you know, more approachable or more empathetic to the way that they want to communicate. And um, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Will that be considered unempathetic if I'm actually use a tool that's going <laughs> to, you know, uh, artificially create a way that I communicate with you? Is that considered like unauthentic? No, I don't think, I mean, I, I think, it, well, I mean, what you're saying is if, if an, if an AI or algorithm tells me what to do and that, it, and I use that in a human interaction, does it make it not authentic? And, uh, and the answer is absolutely not. I mean, I think if you're seeking to create a better human interaction, that's that, you know, whatever method you're using, I don't think is going to be the cause for, for concern. Uh, that's why I just think it's, it's a paradox because I, I do think that the more we're, we're going to use it, the more the AI is going to learn that we need to be more human. So <laughs> instead of, yeah. it's, it's kind of like, instead of the robots thinking they should take over the world, I think what the robots are going to learn is that humans need to be more empathetic to each other. And that's the best system of, you know, of efficiency and productivity and all those other things. And so that's why I think it's kind of a paradox and, and I don't think it's, it makes it inauthentic. So I'm not to get nerdy, but I think what you're saying there is the intention was that I actually just want to have a better human interaction. If it starts from there, then it's authentic and you are being empathetic. Yeah, I mean, I, I, unless you're reading like a script, uh, you know, like right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, of think, course. I, I think then you know, as long as it's, um, it, you know, if, I, I, I don't think it's it's inauthentic to use insights and and suggestions from you know from technology to create better human interactions. Um, as long as it's still you and you're still being yourself, then I think it's totally fine. So the last aspect I'd like to ask you is going looping back to the starting point, which is empathy leading to bigger profits and better life. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering to really execute on that. You touched on it about how millennials and how people now are really almost demanding more empathy. Like, I mean, and millennials, they want to know that you're, you know, what you stand for your purpose. And I'm wondering to really um, uh, accelerate empathy throughout the business. Um, maybe like, does, do you think that it needs to start right at the purpose, the, 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 you know, the brand promise, like what you're really doing in your business. And I'm wondering how many businesses are going to also maybe adjust what they're really about. Like, you know, we've been about profit, but maybe we need to do X and that's going to create like that in itself is the business direction Mm -hmm. is an empathetic direction that then creates an empathetic culture. I don't know if I'm communicating that, but rather than just saying, Hey, we need more empathetic. It's like, actually, maybe we need to change our our entire business mission. Yeah. And that creates a congruent empathy across the organization. Yeah. One of the things that I was struggling with in coming up with the concept for mean people suck was it, it is, it, you know, and again, it was back to his leadership book for, for corporate executives uh, to figure out how to reset their mission statement. Like you just said, or is it more for the low level employee who's feeling, you know, they, they work for, they, they're stuck in a bad job. Um, mm-hmm. And so I tried to do, do both and and actually really hit the question at all levels. And so, for example, uh, and, and I've worked with HR folks um, on employee talent, you know, sort of communication programs. And a lot of HR people, you know, would love to say this is never going to work without executive, you know, buy-in or executive support. And and I disagree. And and so that's what um, I did in the, in the book. I tried to say, if you're the leader of a company your main job is to reset the mission. And so I absolutely talk about that in the book. And I use examples from Microsoft and Lego. And um, uh, there's actually a, a, a talent management company who uh, you know, wanted to walk the walk of talent management and created this amazing culture. And, and I tell the story of, of, of Anne uh, from, from this company in the, in the book. So there are CEO examples. And there's a job to be done for CEOs and leaders. And that is to make sure that there is a purpose-driven mission that uh, anyone would, would, would accept and want to be a part of. That's number one. But that isn't the only thing that has to happen. You have to get your team on board. And so that's why I also address the lower level employees. And I talk about how um, I, I suggest this one question uh, everybody should ask in an interview. And the question is, uh, when you're interviewing your boss, when you're being interviewed, I should say, by your boss, you should ask, do you support ideas uh, from the folks on your team? 
And if you get a chance to interview the future team members um, that you would be working with, ask them if the boss, you know, if the manager supports ideas from their team. I believe that that creates uh, an understanding, at least going in, as to whether you're going to be working for a micromanager or not. But also, it's an, it helps, an, I think, build this culture of, of where managers know their job is to support people, not just tell them what to do. And, and then middle managers need to, you know, kind of given that message that supporting their team, having empathy is the right, is, is the only way really to manage a team. And so I talk in the book about whether you're the lower level, middle, middle level, or, or, you know, higher level of the org chart, um, you know, what is the job that you should be doing? And it's really putting focus on customer values, obviously purpose, um, but managing your team from a position of respect and having empathy for their for their innovations and ideas. And, and you know, I give examples. The, the Jim Stengel's book, Grow, shows that companies with a purpose-driven mission are, have a 400% higher stock price. Um, Microsoft, with the, the shift that they made with Satya Nadella to a more empathetic work work culture, um, their stock price was up, you know, uh, I think more than almost any other Fortune 500 company in the last five years. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of good examples there, but there's a job to be done no matter where you are in the org. I mean, that's a big part of my book, Groundswell. Like, if you're going to build a groundswell for support, you need a purpose-driven organization, Absolutely. like, without question. Yeah. So, you've, it sounds like you've totally addressed, like, communicating, like, why, the, the next question I have is, does your book cover this or do you have uh, any insight on how? Meaning, so say I listen to, I read your book and I'm a leader, but I'm un, unempathetic. Like, I'm like, well, okay, I get it. I need to do, I need to be more empathetic. How do you transform to become empathetic? Yeah, so I do, I do offer a couple of, of, um, of suggestions in the book and I kind of alluded to it, but I, I call it the one question, it's the one question survey. The one question survey and, and I did this at a test uh, client um, where we took a single department and the survey went out to all of the managers in the group. And, it, and the question was, does your manager support new ideas from the team? And what we found was that in a pre-post of that survey going out, there was like a three times increase in the amount of employee engagement. And and I think it, it was and, – and the survey took place too soon to, to measure actual change – what we were measuring really was the impact of just the survey itself. And what we found was that when employees, managers, and leaders get the message that supporting, and I call it being a champion leader, uh, get the message that champion leadership is the way to go, supporting ideas on your team, it creates this dramatic and massive and, and rapid change inside organizations. It creates this you know thing that I call the bullseye. Um, I also talk about so that's one method. So that's the champion leader question. There's also I talk about how um, there's a, there's a way for managers to treat their team so that they're not always just looking for status reports. And so, you know, if you've seen the movie Office Space, you know, the TPS report, um, you know, mm -hmm. example. And and the, the, the three questions that I recommend managers use is, how are you doing? Um, so a manager should, you know, should start with, how are you doing? Um, second would be, how am I doing? And so the manager is giving up authority and giving up control to his employees or her employees to, to accept that, that uh, she or he wants to know how she's doing. I mean, it, it takes you know humility um, to, to to kind of be able to ask that question. The third is, what can I do to help? And that gets to that one question. You know, the how, how are you supporting ideas from your team? Um, so that's another method. Um, there's another a number of other things. The bullseye org chart itself is, um, I think, a tool that organizations can use. Uh, and I think we talked about this in our last, in our last episode and it, it, it essentially gets enacted when teams are asking what's in it for the customer. And, you know, the joke that I always make is if a marketer gets asked by a CEO to go, you know, put their logo on the side of a stadium for $25 million, uh, and they ask what's in it for the customer, you know, and I tell this story in the book um, of you know Cap Gemini and a, and a really courageous marketer who pushed back against that uh, request coming from their CEO. Um, if you ask what's in it for the customer, you'll end up doing things that support customer support, you know, support customer value and customer experiences. Um, so those are just three quick tools, um, and there's a number of others that I mention in the book. Again, you know, no matter where you are in the organization. That's a really powerful question. What's in it for the customer? I'm. If you don't mind, I want to quote that and reference you in my book because 
I think that that guides a lot, if you don't mind, mm-hmm, like, please, I'm getting your permission on here. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, what I like about that is, and you just gave me an idea. It's like, when you ask that question, and, and if you were to do that, when people are doing some of these crazy nonsensical um, campaigns and spends, it's like, I try to communicate, and, and now you've given me the powerful question, try to communicate going, why don't you just reinvest in the customer experience or your people? And that's going to yield the result you're looking for. That's a better form of marketing than just doing some of these sponsorship and 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 components because it keeps on giving. It's not a one time thing. It's like it's a regeneration of of an exponential return. Do you know what I'm saying? It's it's exactly it. And and you know the story that I tell with Cap Gemini. Um, what's really interesting, Rena Patel is the, is the person that was involved there. And, and, um, one of my, she was one of my first clients because she was asking what's in it for the customer of a big, you know, uh, uh, golf sponsorship basically was the request. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she had the research that showed that, uh, you know, only a small portion of their, of their prospect base actually cared about golf. Um, you know, so the leaders were sort of the leadership in the organization was making an assumption that everybody loved golf because they did. And, and then, so what she then went out to figure out was, well, what are the questions that our audience is asking? And what she realized was that she needed her own team members, the the colleagues in the, the, you know, the, the consultants that she was trying to promote as a marketer. She needed them to share their expertise. And so what's in it for the customer became what's in it for my colleagues and how do I get them to start sharing their expertise? And it's called the Capgemini Expert Program. And they identified a bunch of experts. And, and then what they found was when they, they nurtured and activated these experts to create authentic, helpful content, those consultants ended up closing a lot of business. And so what's in it for the customer became what's in it for the colleague became what, what's in it for the company. And the company generated additional sales at, you know, uh, 0.1% of the cost of a golf sponsorship just by follow, just by asking that one question, you know, focusing on customer value means you have to answer questions and the people that can answer those questions are your employees. <laughs> and when you create an environment that makes them want to share and celebrates their, their expertise, um, you generate more business for the company. So that's essentially how empathy is the secret to success for better profits and a you know happier life. Well said. In that example, was that are those people consultants? Were they internal or external? They were internal. So she she internal. actually you know created a platform that still exists today that celebrates their employees and what they know and gets their employees to kind of you know and they use various methods to do this, but to share share their expertise. That expertise and that sharing attracts prospects and leads, and those leads convert to sales. It's just it's the coolest thing ever. It's it's I I always say it's the most it's the highest ROI marketing program I have ever seen because they generated $24 million in sales on, you know, a $200,000 investment in, in, in two years. So how do you motivate them outside of, do you, is it like, do you just like, do you go, this is your job. We want you to be front facing on LinkedIn doing videos or something, or is there like a form of uh, remuneration or what's the, what would be the, why would they be motivated to do that? To shift, like say from, Someone who's like a product manager who's now going, hey, I'm going to go on, on LinkedIn and start answering customer questions. Like, what what have you learned or what what means have you seen to motivate an organization? Because I think this will be something people will be really keen to know ideas around that. Yeah, well, it, it gets back to, well, there's a couple of things. And I do do address this. It's a whole chapter in the book. Um, I use another story from a good friend of mine, Jason Miller from LinkedIn, and, and how he activated some, some of his colleagues. It really comes down to, and it's something we're seeing a lot of interest in actually right now, is people uh, you know, updating their resumes and trying to build their personal brand. I've seen, I, I think I've seen at least three or four ads for webinars on how to build your personal brand. And, and that's really the trick is the, the message isn't, hey, we want you to create content or we'll pay you to create content. The message is, hey, we're creating a platform that celebrates our employees and their expertise. Are you someone that wants to participate? And if you do, what you will see is you will see um, you'll you'll grow your you know your reputation in the in the industry. You'll um, you know we will support you and celebrate you as one of our employees. And so it, there is something in it for them, and and highlighting that as part of the program and finding the folks that kind of intuitively get it, but give them you know one of the biggest 
concerns I always hear is, well, I'm not a writer. And that's the easiest thing to get past. I mean, I, I used to send out five question emails to experts when I worked at SAP. And it was just like, you know, tell me something interesting about yourself. Uh, what do you do on a daily basis and why? Tell me about a problem you've solved and how. And um, usually the answers to those questions become a blog post. You know, it's it's not hard to get people to talk about themselves and what they know and ter- to turn that into something that's, you know, shareable and consumable. So, you know, offering those simple um, support steps really help to, I think, get people over their fears. And what do you say to the manager owner that, um, this actually is a real objection because I had the exact same framework that you described. I even described how it would improve their personal brand. And, uh, and I think that he was getting people that were excited, but his concern was that, well, I don't want them to get such a good brand that they want to go on their own or get picked up by someone else. What do you say about that? Yeah, it's, I, I've heard that before as well. Like, why would I want to build, why would I want to help promote my employees so that they can go on, go and, and be hired away by my competition? Well, it, and, and there's a quote that, that kind of gets at this. Um, and it's more about like training. Um, and I think the quote is something like, you know, a CEO says, why would I spend money to train my employees so they can leave? Um, and, and the, the response is, uh, um, but if you don't, they're more likely to leave, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, it's sort of like a, an arms race, I guess, if you will. The, I think the bottom line is company employees will want to work more at a company that celebrates them than a company that doesn't. And, Employees are going to leave and, and should leave if they're not in the right you know market fit for their for their job anyway, and so that 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 stuff happens and I think it's extremely short sighted. Um, it's a natural question to ask, but I think it's extremely short sighted to be concerned about it because, like I said, employees will want to work at companies that celebrate their employees. Um, and giving them a platform to celebrate them creates more goodwill, I think, than it does uh, you know risk in in people leaving. Interesting. I had this, uh, uh, she's a client of mine. Uh, she's been in the insurance industry. Her name's uh, Anissa. And she had a great comment to something around this discussion. She's like, look, Scott, she goes, people work for me. I'm just a stop on their journey. So if I can elevate them, I just accept the fact that no one's going to be with me forever. So if I'm just part of, um, you know, elevating them to their next position, um, you know, they're going to stay with me just a little longer because they know that I care about them. And to me, it, it just, it creates fulfillment and it also creates a, uh, a reputation for people knowing that when they work there, they're going to learn, they're going to expand and they're going to grow. And that just means I'm going to attract better people. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really kind of clever. I, I, she just, she just didn't even try to do anything to contain them. She just wanted to unleash them. Yeah. And, and it, that's exactly one of the undercurrents of the book. And I, I like I said, I even talk, the, the story of the HR um, uh, talent management company um, is just a great one because they, they, they learned themselves that, um, you know, the best, the best marketing you can have is happy employees. The best way to attract talent to a company is to have your existing talent talk about how much they love their job. And, and that becomes, you know, its own form of marketing. And that's why we're starting to see this weird conflagration of HR and marketing and, and, you know, talent management and all those kinds of things. Um, culture, like you said, you know, innovation, um, in the book for the book, I did a, a, a survey that showed that, um, there's not a single company that an employee thinks is innovative where those that that same employee wasn't happy. And in other words, <laughs> there was a direct correlation between happy employees and business success and innovation. And and so, you know, happy employees talk about it, they do better work and they create higher profits for organizations. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, one last thought or comment and and this is because I'm I'm writing my book and I'm getting uh, breakthroughs writing my book. I thought my ideas were already prepared and I'm writing my book and I'm realizing I'm learning more as I write it. Mm-hmm. My question to you is this, when you wrote this book, what, what breakthrough or big idea didn't ha- that happened while you're writing the book, not before you wrote the book, that is something that you can sort of leave with people to go. This is really something that, uh, uh, about mean people suck that you could really you know, bite on, but it was something that you just didn't expect. Yeah. I think the big, the big idea came in the form of the title and I was, I can't take full credit. I was actually brainstorming with, um, with, uh, with somebody that works for my publisher and, and, um, and he kind of suggested something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, 
basically, you know, bad, bad bosses and, and, you know, the, it sort of sparked the idea be- behind mean people suck. And, and the, but the big, the, the irony about the title was that we all, we all sort of nod our head. I think when we, when we hear the term mean people suck or, you know, um, you know, you know, we don't want to work for, nobody wants to work for a jerk. Um, but what, a, one of the things that I really tried to do after really in the kind of the editing phase was to give people a sense that they're in control. And that's, that was kind of the big, big aha from that title brainstorming was yes. Mean people suck and empathy is the, the way out. But, um, you, you know, I think we live in a culture where sometimes people love to complain and, 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 be, and feel victims and don't feel that they have control. And so I, I really wanted to give, you know, or the big aha moment I think came from when we came up with the title was I wanted to give people the tools, you know, like you asked about to feel that they can control, improve their situation, whether they stay in their job or not, um, whether they stay in a bad marriage or not, you know, whatever the life situation is that we're in control and we can change our situations for the better. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, I, this is like you've changed the way I think um, and I've followed you for years and that last podcast was amazing and and this one's going to be I'm sure uh, listened to in a big way. I think it's like breaking through exactly what's going on in the world today. Um, if you want to share with everybody where they can follow you, find you and and just where you'd like to people to connect with you. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. It was, uh, and I'd be happy to come back anytime, talk to you, but it, uh, uh, yeah, if people want to reach out, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, is usually the best way you can find more about my marketing agency, marketing insider group, uh, at marketing insider group.com. And, uh, I do have a website for the book. It's mean people Um, I couldn't believe that the URL was available for just a couple hundred bucks, but it was so, um, That's awesome. and then I thought I was going to become maybe a, a, a billionaire selling t-shirts with mean people suck on it um i've only sold two so if you want i'll probably put a discount on the website <laughs> and if anybody's interested discount code called groundswell exactly yeah. mean people suck.com <laughs> feel free to, to uh you know uh pick out your favorite t-shirt design and i'll, I'll happy to send it to you awesome thank you again and absolutely i'll have you back on again i feel like there's like always you know there's three things that just came up already in this that was like oh we could talk about that mm-hmm. But wanted to keep it sort of like in this lane way of empathy and your book. Um, thank you again for being on the show. And uh, to everyone that's listening, you know, thank you again. I really do appreciate uh, your attention and time. It means so much to me. Um, as always, go to groundswell.fm. And actually now, instead of sending me an email, I got a little mic on there. Just press record. Send me a voicemail. I'll uh, uh, tell me whatever you're thinking. Uh, I'm going to do a roll up episode with what people say think and and good bad and ugly i'll put it on there and until next time mahalo 